we thank uh, Norman and the, the worship and production team for, for leading us this morning. These guys are here probably before it's legal to be here. And I sat early and next week is going to be even earlier, guys, so I'm praying for you all. We're all losing an hour of sleep next week, FYI. If that's a spoiler alert for you, I'm sorry. I refer to it as the worst day of the year. But I will be here and I will be excited to be with you just an hour earlier than normal. Um, anyway, uh, my name is Michael. Uh, I'm excited to be with you. We as a church, we exist to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. We do that by multiplying disciples uh, and churches in real relationship. One example you can see of multiplying disciples is that Norm is wearing something very similar to, to, to me. That's discipleship and process. Um, we start to look and talk and act like each other, so that's a, a clear representation. Another is our churches, Northside and Cheney. I was out at Cheney last week, got to, to preach out there and share the word with them, and it's just exciting to see what God is doing um, in his church, and we truly believe that this is Jesus' church. It's not my church, it's not your church, it's his church, and so uh, our heart is to, to figure out, well, who is Jesus then? If this is his church and we're called to follow him, who is he? And that's what really sparked our journey through the book of Luke. We wanted to go through a gospel together as a church and really discover who Jesus is. And uh, I love the book of Luke because Luke spent so much time going through all the details. Luke was a doctor, and so details matter to doctors. And he also spent a lot of time with Paul, who uh, one, of the, one of the apostles who wrote a lot of the New Testament. He spent time traveling with Paul on his missionary trips, and so he got to see uh, at work the gospel spreading throughout the nations. And so he spent a lot of time carefully putting together this letter to this man named Theophilus, who he said, hey, you can trust this. I put care and detail into this so that what you were taught, you can have faith and know that it's true. And so I love this book. Uh, last week, Brandon did a great job kind of closing out chapter two, where we saw and kind of unpacked the idea that Jesus is, is fully God and fully man. He's not one or the other. He's not 50% God, 50% man. He's 100% and 100%. And if that math doesn't work in your brain, welcome to the club. There's a thing called faith where we can trust that God is, is, is true. And, um, and this week, we're jumping into chapter 3. We're getting closer and closer to Jesus' public ministry when Jesus shows up on the scene and starts uh, sharing the good news and, and healing and doing all the miracles and calling people to follow him. We're weeks away from that, but we're, we're, we're reintroduced to this man, uh, John the Baptist. He's the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, and he was um, called and created to prepare the way for the Messiah. The Messiah, the Savior, the Christ, um, the, the one who would restore relationship between God and his people back. And uh, this idea of, of having a Savior means you need to be in a place where you need a Savior. You need to be at the end of yourself. And so many times I spend so much of my time insulating myself, working hard not to get to that place where I need help. Uh, I'm pretty uh, stubborn and um, stubborn and kind of stubborn where I want to do things all on my own. And, uh, and so I, I try to avoid that place of being at the end of myself. But that's truly where freedom comes. That's truly where hope comes because if I don't need rescue, if I don't need help, if I don't need a hero to intervene, I, I, the idea of, of a savior coming to save me means nothing if I can try to do it on my own. And so that's kind of the, the tension that uh, we're entering into chapter three is that John is coming to prepare the hearts of the people, to try to cultivate their need for a savior. And um, the, the bottom line for today is a prepared heart is a soft heart. And so God is preparing us and cultivating us through our life, through our circumstances, through people, um, to get us to a place of having a soft heart so we can receive the Messiah, the Savior. And so this is Luke chapter 3, verse 1. I'm just going to warn you, there's some names in here that I'm going to butcher, and it's okay because you would butcher them too. And so we're just going to move on. Um, but yeah, so 
Verse 1 says this, It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Iturea and Traconidas. Uh, Licinius was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. At this time, a message from God came to John, who was the son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. And I want to pause there just for a moment. Again, I love how Luke writes this letter because he's anchoring it in reality, in human history. He's not saying uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, something happened. He goes, no, no, during the reign of Tiberius, which we can look back in our history books and say that's A.D. 14 to A.D. 37. This is a real time, a real place, a real events that happened. And so Luke is always kind of drawing us back to, hey, this really happened. You can look up in the books. There was really this guy, Tiberius. There's really this guy, John. There's really this guy, Jesus. He's always trying to anchor us back into that truth. And I love that because it helps me, who's many, many years from this time, to, to go, oh, I can have faith that this is true. Because I can look in a history book and find these guys' names. And so this is really helpful for, for us as we journey. And so it says in verse 3, Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River. He was preaching that the people should be baptized to show that they had repented from their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Now Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, and this is from Isaiah 40 that Luke is quoting, he says, he is the voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the roads for him, the valleys will be filled, the mountains and hills will be made level, the curves will be straightened, and the rough places made smooth, and then all people will see the salvation sent from God. Again, I love how, how Luke is helping us understand he sees John, the Baptist, who's out in the wilderness. He sees him as the one that Isaiah prophesied about many, many years ago. He said, this is the guy. He is preparing the way for the Lord. And John is out there calling people to repentance and to baptism, repentance from their sin. And this is a thing that is more than just a bummer, like I messed up. I'll try not to mess up again. Repentance is, is true godly sorrow that leads us to change our life from, from doing things our own way to doing things God's way. And so godly repentance is in our heart. It starts in our heart. It's more of a mindset, and it, it changes our direction. We can't say we're repentant if we keep going the same way. Like if we just keep going this way and go, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not repentance. Repentance is, God, I'm sorry. I want to follow you. I want to go where you're going. Help me to trust you and your ways. There is a change in our life. And, and I love the significance of how how Luke is writing this with, with Isaiah and John kind of uh, mirroring each other in this, this, this imagery. He's going, hey, God's come to make things right. This imagery of, of the crooked roads made straight, the mountaintops made low and level, the valleys filled up, the rough things smooth. He's going, the Messiah is coming to make broken things healed, to make the hurting people encouraged. He's coming to make things right. And the Jewish people were, were anticipating. They were anticipating the Messiah coming. But they viewed it differently. They, they said, the Messiah is coming to rescue us from Rome. He is coming to make these things right, which is take the Romans out and then we're going to be in charge. We're going to have our own king. It's going to be amazing. And John's going, no, 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 like, this isn't about them. This is about you. This is about us being right with God. True repentance leads us to right relationship with God, not just a power that's over us being removed so another power can be in place, put in place. And so the same thing for us, I think the Jewish people were, were focused on the temporary, the physical, when God's preparing us for an eternity with him. God's trying to get us to lift our eyes off of our circumstances, to place them on him, and he's calling us to what he has for us. And I wonder, you know, for, for you, for me, how, how do we walk in here today? Are we coming in carrying our circumstances? Maybe asking God to, to remove the circumstances when God's going, hey, 
I'm, I'm using those circumstances to prepare you for an eternity with me. I think of when I come in here and, and sometimes I'm, I'm dragging in the week and I go, oh gosh, oh, why do we have to sing that same song again? And this worship comes about me, me, me and all this stuff. And God's going, hey, lift your eyes off of yourself. Put them on me. Worship me because I am good. Your week may have been bad, but I am still good. You may have messed up and been unfaithful this week, but I am faithful. I am good. Worship me. He's preparing my heart for an eternity of worship. Because if I hate worship now, I'm gonna be a, it's going to be a rude awakening when I walk into heaven. And they're just like, hey, so when's worship? When's not worship? We're constantly worshiping. Oh, that same song again? It's even, it may even be worse for you if, you if you think we repeat songs here. It's literally like holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We're going to run that one again. Holy, holy, holy. God is preparing our hearts for an eternity with him. Um, and so then when the crowds came to John, so this is John, he's out in the wilderness. When the crowds came to John for baptism, he had some choice words for them. Here's what he said. He said, you brood of snakes, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Prove by the way that you live that you've repented of your sins and have turned to God. And, and he's already anticipating their, their rebuttal. So he goes, hey, don't just think to yourself or say to yourself, hey, we're safe because we're descendants of Abraham. Literally, that means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from those very stones. Even right now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. There'll be another one in the fire. So this is not the application point where I uh, have Caleb come out and bring us megaphones and we go start standing on corners shouting, hey, you, you brood of snakes. <laughs> God's judgment's coming. No, we have to understand the context of, of who John is speaking to. First of all, John's in the wilderness. People came and sought him out. He didn't go into the city square and start yelling at them. Secondly, the people that were coming are religious people. They're church people. It would be like us going, we hear about this guy sharing a message and we're all going to go to him. And so these words come to to religious people who think they've got it all figured out, who are coming out because they heard about this baptism and they wanted to get a badge of baptism to add to their resume of being good Jewish people who followed the law, who, who tithed, who brought the temple tax, who did all of these things right. They're going to put the badge of baptism on too. And we'll get to it in a couple weeks, but Jesus was very kind and gracious to those who had no context for God who had no context for right or for wrong. He had compassion for them. And he would call them into relationship with him. He would often heal them, forgive them. And then he would say, hey, now sin no more. Don't, don't keep going down the same direction. Repent, turn, follow me. But he had harsh words, very similar to this, to the religious people. So I've got it all figured out. I've got it all figured out. I don't need a savior. I don't need this. I don't need that. I've, got to, I've done everything. I've kept every law. John's words here were meant to, to pierce the, the religious people's hearts. Not to condemn them, but to pierce their hearts. To get them to repent and turn to God. And not rest on their morals. I've kept the law since, the, since I was very young. I've done everything. I've never missed church. I even serve in the kids' ministry. That gets me an extra bonus. They, they had all of these things. And he's going, no, 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 no. None of that matters. He wasn't yelling at them to condemn them. And then saying, hey, beat it. No, he was going, I, I care for you. I love you. You have to understand the truth. You don't have it figured out. You don't. Listen, even if you're resting on being a, a child of Abraham, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't matter. What matters is your personal relationship with God. Have you repented? Have you turned to him and followed him? That's what really matters. John's heart was that people would come to know God and follow God. He was preaching messages to prepare their hearts for the true Messiah. 
Because if the Messiah comes and goes, hey, I'm here to save you, to, to restore your relationship with God, and, and everyone goes, I don't need that. I follow the rules. I don't need God. I don't need a Savior. I follow all the rules. I do it just like I was taught. They would reject Jesus. And again, many, that's what happened. Many of them rejected Jesus. So John's trying to prepare their hearts, soften their hearts, going, you do need a Savior, a Messiah. He is coming. And just because you're the children of Abraham doesn't mean anything. He's, he's bringing a, a bigger picture. And, and this may ruffle some feathers, but there's a saying going around that we're all God's children. And that's not really true. We're all God's creation. And we've decided to break relationship with him and do things our own way. God sent Jesus to make a way that we could be adopted. That's why there's a lot of this adopted language from Paul and all of these things where he's going, you've been adopted into God's family. Then you become children of God. Before that, you're children of wrath. It says in Ephesians, you're children of wrath who are destined for destruction. But when you turn to Jesus and you follow him, God lavishes his love on you and he calls you his children and that's what you are. And so he's, he's trying to help, tell these people and help them. It doesn't matter who your parents are. Do you know Jesus? Do you follow God? Be the same argument here. If, if you're standing before God and they go, so how, how are, how's our relationship? You go, Oh, well, my parents know you, so we're good. That's not how it works. Well, some will even say, I've done many miracles for you. I've cast out demons in your name, Jesus. I was a part of that church plant. I invited people to church on Sundays. I served in kids' ministry. I've, I've faithfully tithed every single week. What is Jesus going to say? He says it in Matthew 7. He says, depart from me, for I never knew you. It's about relationship. It's about doing life God's way with God. And so John is, is saying these harsh words because he loves these people. He's not on the outside throwing rocks at their, their religion or their viewpoint. He's in the middle of it going, hey, none of that matters. And how do we know that? We know that because the crowds in verse 10 say, what should we do? What should we do? If, if they heard it, maybe how sometimes we read it, that this is just some guy with passion, we would call it passion. Some would call it anger issues. You're just yelling at them. They would probably give them whatever the Jewish signal is for get lost. That's a nice way of, church way of saying it. And then they would leave. They wouldn't go, hey, well, what do we do? You could see his, his heart was for his people. They heard the harsh words. And I'm sure it hurt, but it moved into the place, of, well, then what do we do? What should we do? And so John replies, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, teacher, what should we do? And he said, collect no more taxes than the government requires. What should we do, said some soldiers. John said, don't extort money or make false accusations and be content with your pay. John is, is showing that there's, there's two kingdoms involved here. There's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. There's, there's God's way, there's man's way. And he's saying there is a difference. You can't toe the line in between. You're either following God and, and part of his kingdom, or you're following man and a part of its kingdom. And so he, he's unpacking these things. It's part, of, part of its integrity, you can't say one thing and do another. So, so, so you, if you want to... Be here and show fruit of your, of your conversion. Again, he said, fruit is an important thing, right? He said, every tree that doesn't produce, produce good fruit gets cut. He goes, man, if you want to show good fruit, you have to show lives that respond and, and declare who God is. God's a generous God. So if you have something that somebody needs, give it to them. If, if you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, stop doing it. Again, the question would be, if someone met you on the street and just saw your life, would they be able to accuse you of loving and following Jesus? Or would you just be like everybody else? John is, is encouraging these people. Live lives in, in manners that, that reflect who God is, 
who his kingdom is. Don't just look out for yourself. Look at the needs of the people around you. Encourage one another. If, and again, he says, he says, don't just stop collecting taxes. Oh, you work for the Romans? They're bad. Stop doing that. No, he goes, no, no. Do that. Do your job well. Don't steal from the people above and beyond what you're called to, to do. So for some of us, we have jobs. Do them. Do them well. Honor God with your work. Don't cheat and rob people. Even if you're in an industry that cheats and robs people, do what you're called to do. But don't, like, tax collecting is not bad. Double taxing, triple taxing people, that's bad. Again, John's trying to cultivate their heart to soften their heart. James reminds us in, in James 4, 17, says, remember, it's a sin to know what you should do and then not do it. And so in verse 15, everyone is expecting the Messiah. They're waiting for his arrival. They're eager to know whether John might be this Messiah because he's saying things that are different than what they're hearing in the temple. He's saying things that are radical. He's saying things that the Messiah might say. And John answered their, their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. John used many such warnings as he announced the good news to the people. And then John also publicly criticized Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, for marrying Herodias, his brother's wife, and for many other wrong things he had done. So Herod put John in prison, adding this sin to his many others. And so John was warning the people of God's judgment that was coming. And he used this illustration of, of the wheat and the chaff. The chaff is the husk on the outside of the wheat kernel. That's good for nothing that needs to be separated off so you can have the good wheat. And so the winnowing fork is literally like a pitchfork they used to, to move stuff and it would break the things apart. And then he would gather the, the good, put it in the barn, and the, all the husks would be thrown in the fire. The people understood that John was talking about God's coming. And he's going to separate those who love him and follow him from those who don't. And those who don't are going to end up in fire which is, again, a representation of hell and eternity separated from God. And again, John is, I love his heart. He, he was eccentric, sure. You can see that from other gospel accounts where he, would, he would, was wearing camels, camel, uh, like basically burlap, burlap sacks for clothes, and he was eating honey and grasshoppers. He was an eccentric dude, but he had such humility that when he was asked, are you the Messiah? He said, no, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. In John 3.30, he says, he must increase, I must decrease. And, and there's this imagery, John had a lot on his resume. He was a miracle baby himself. And if you remember that from the first chapter of Luke, his mom Elizabeth was barren. And then an angel came to her and shared with uh, her, his parents, yeah, you actually are going to have a kid. So he's a miracle baby. He was prophesied to prepare the way for, for Jesus, the Messiah. He, he has all, he's a great preacher with a ministry where people are coming from the cities and the towns out into the wilderness to hear him speak. All of these things are areas where he could have so much pride, but he had a humility about him. He goes, no, no, I'm not even fit to untie his sandals. And he is coming. I only baptize with water. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit which is God's, uh, God himself, but it's his deposit into us as we say yes to, to God and put our faith in Jesus. He deposits the Holy Spirit into us as a guide, as a counselor, as a friend, as someone who can uh, unpack the word of truth for us, convict us, have us you know, follow God more intimately. And with fire, fire represents God's purifying transformation power in our lives. When you and I surrender to him, God purifies us through his fire. So John is, is humbly preparing the way for, for the Messiah. And then we see in verse 21, the Messiah shows up. It says, one day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. 
And as he was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son. You bring me great joy. So we're, we're about to pivot the narrative to Jesus's ministry. And I love that Jesus comes and he gets baptized. And in this picture, we see the Trinity. We see God who is one, in it, but in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see all of these present in one moment. And I love this, that Jesus himself was baptized. Did he need to be baptized? Absolutely not. He was fully God, yet he was fully man. He, he didn't sin at all, so he had nothing to repent of. But I loved it because Jesus is fully man. He is a model for us. He lived his life in a way that we can model our lives after. Jesus baptized, got baptized, and he calls us to be baptized. And he commands us to go and baptize others. Matthew 28 says, go, make disciples and baptize them. And I love that about Jesus. He is so full of integrity. He will never ask you to do anything that he himself hasn't already done. And so he leads the way. And so John is, is sharing this message of the Savior who's showing up. And it's Jesus. And he's sharing these harsh words, not to condemn them, but to convict them, to pierce their heart, to, to make their heart soft, to realize that they are really at the end of themselves. And when you and I realize that the end of ourselves is a gift, we start to experience life. The end of ourselves is a gift from God. When we get to the place where all we have left is Jesus, we realize that all we need is Jesus. And when we try to shore up our life and insulate it that we don't practically or functionally need a Savior anymore, that's a dangerous place to be. And I've done that. I do that over and over again. I try to shore up things in my life, and I'm not saying we shouldn't grow and mature but there's certain areas in my life where I try to sure up where I don't even need to have faith anymore because I've already got that figured out. And that's a bad place to be. Why? Because my heart starts to harden towards the things of God. When God is calling me in the next things, I, my heart is hardened. I think of even the last couple of weeks I've been uh, wrestling with, it uh, looks like I'm having a, a flare-up in my, my autoimmune disease and, and so my body is is shutting down in, in many ways, and it's really hard, and it's tough, and I, God, I can do this. I can muscle through. Uh, you know, I'm falling asleep now at 6.15, 7, you know, 7 o'clock at night. I'm going, I'll just muscle through. I'll grab coffee, and I'll go back on coffee, which I hadn't had for nine months, because I'll just push through. I can handle this, and I'll start doing these things, and, and my heart's starting to harden, and God's going, no, no. Come to me. Trust in me. No, no, God, but I have stuff to do. I've got meetings to have. I've got things to accomplish. He goes, I know of those things. Come to me. And when I started to turn back to him, go, okay, God, I'm broken. My body is broken. I need you. That's when my heart started to soften again. And so for us, some of us are in circumstances that we're guarding our hearts and we're trying to protect and insulate ourselves. When God is, is using those circumstances, that season of your life, to call you into greater things, to call you to more intimacy with him, to call you to your next steps of faith in him. And we have to resist the urge to, to harden our hearts and try to do it on our own. We need to, to remain soft. And for me, I think the best thing that's helped me is to, to be in community, to let people in, to know what's going on in my heart and in my mind. Because I need people that will come and say harsh words like John says, come up and go, hey, Michael, you're being an idiot right now. I love you, but you're being an idiot. Come on. Don't harden your heart. Don't run from God in this moment. I need people that will love me enough to, to call me back to God's purpose in my life. I need people to help pick me up off the ground when I fall. I need people in my life that will point me towards Jesus and not towards a temporary fix. I don't know how many of us have gone through experiences where we get advice from people. That is the worst thing we've ever could have heard. Oh yeah, well hey, what you just need to do right now is just go medicate. Go have a beer. I'll, I'll take your mind off of this. What? No, no. We should go to Jesus. Go to pray. Spend time before God. 
And so that's why like, we love groups around here, connect groups, because we get to encourage one another towards Jesus in the good seasons and in the bad seasons, in the good times and the tough times. And so I want us to be a people that our hearts are soft because the softness of our hearts is connected to our obedience to Jesus. The harder my heart is, the less likely I'm going to be obedient to Jesus. The softer my heart is, is directly connected to my obedience with him. And that's why we call people to next steps each and every week because we know God is speaking. God is calling each of us into more relationship with him, more intimacy with him. That's why we have baptisms here each and every week. That's why we have a tank here. We have shorts, shirts, towels, everything we need to take that step in the back. Why? Because if God's speaking to you to trust him, to follow him, and to be baptized, we don't want you to wait. We want you to be able to say, yes, God, I'm trusting you. I'm following you. Because baptism is just an outward display of what God's doing on the inside. But there are going to be bigger things that God's going to call you into. He's going to say, hey, I want you to go talk to your neighbor across the street. And I want to be people that don't, don't sit back and think, what well, would God really say for me to love my neighbor? No, I want us to be people that go, okay, God, knock on the door. Hey, what are you doing? I'm just saying hi. I'm supposed to. How's it going? As you can see, this is super comfortable. But... Hey, because in those moments, that's when God, when you're at the end of yourself, that's when God moves. That's when he changes your hearts, but he also changes the hearts of the people around you. God is still preparing the way today. He's not using John the Baptist anymore. He's using you. He's using me. He's using us. He's using our life to prepare the way for people's hearts. So for those who are far from God, we show compassion and we show them that there is a God who, who loves them and has a plan and a purpose for them and wants a relationship with them. For those that we're in relationship with who maybe are, are getting religious and less relational with God, but more religious, we call them out on it. Not to condemn them, but to get them to repent. Hey, you're off track. Come back. God loves you. Again, he has a plan and a purpose for you. This is not it. Again, we need each other. So this morning, I want us to be a people who respond to God. And so if you're in the room and you want to put your faith in Jesus and be baptized, we have everything you need. There's uh, Jen's in the back. She would love to pray with you and help you take that next step. For some of us, our next step is to, to ask God for prayer. Maybe it's prayer to get us uh, out of a circumstance that we're in, but maybe it's a prayer that, that God would give us the strength and courage to, to persevere the season we're in. And so we're going to have a team of people up front that want to pray with you. If you need prayer, don't leave today without getting prayer. And the rest of us, we're going to worship God. Why? Because he is good. He is good whether we've had a great week or a bad week. He is good whether we were faithful or not faithful. He is good, and he, he deserves our worship. And so I want to invite you to stand as I close in prayer this morning. God, I thank you that you are good. God, I thank you that you are faithful. God, I thank you that you, you saw us in desperate need of, of a Savior, destined for an eternity separated from you. And you sent Jesus. God, we're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful, Jesus, that you were obedient, even to death on the cross, that you stood in our place that we could just put our faith in you. We might be restored to right relationship with God the Father. So Jesus, we thank you. The Holy Spirit, we thank you for empowering us, for convicting us when we start to walk down a wrong path, for encouraging us in season and out of season. We thank you. And so God, I pray for us as a people, God, that you would stir us up, that we'd be people who are passionate about you and being in your presence. God, I pray that we would be quick to be uh, obedient to your call in our lives. God, help us not to judge whether a thing is too big or too small. Help us just to say, yes, Lord, and take that step of faith. So God, we worship you this morning. We thank you this morning. We ask that you would do a work in us and through us for your glory. God, we pray that this whole city would come to know you. 
one person at a time. We thank you for this opportunity to join you at your work here. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're getting baptized, head to the back. If you need prayer, come forward. The rest of us, let's worship.